thank you so much for uh, for the invitation. So, um, right. Well, first of all, what does my lab do? Well, and, and I know this is a bit cliche, but we really try to work at sort of this intersection of small molecule synthesis, catalysis, and nanomaterial. So this makes it pretty broad ranging. So we're interested in making small discrete uh, molecules. We're interested in um, nanomaterials, more extended systems, and we want to combine them ultimately um, for the purpose of catalysis, for promoting chemical reactions in a more efficient and more selective controllable manner. Um, so this is obviously really broad ranging. So what I'm going to do today is just give you a, a, a brief flavor of, of the concept of my lab and then a more recent project that highlights at least what we are currently focusing on. Uh, and hopefully this will lead to, to good discussion going forward. Um, in case anyone is interested, and of course, we're always happy to help out some equipment that we have that is kind of neat that you might not find uh, everywhere. We've got uh, UV vis with a lot of in situ probing capabilities. We've got FTIR with grazing angle reflectance. We have a thermogravimetric analyzer that's actually housed inside of a glove box so we can do completely air and moisture free TGA analysis. Uh, we've got a single crystal x-ray diffraction in our lab. It's the only single crystal x-ray in all of central Florida. Uh, so that's a nice new capability that we got last year. We can do atomic layer deposition uh, thermally using ozone or H2S capability, which we've not started yet. We can do thermal CVD, polymer CVD, optical microscopy, and soon we're going to be getting uh, an FTIR microscope that can do grazing angle um, as well. And we also do grazing UV vis. So we've got a lot of capabilities, um, and you know, so far they they've led to good collaboration. So again, if there's anything that we have that you think might be uh, of use, then certainly please contact me. My email is it's down here at the bottom, or check out our website. I'm fairly easy to reach. So again, today I'm going to be talking about a specific example that highlights sort of this, this ethos or this approach that we have in our lab. And this is not so much in terms of this, in the small molecule synthesis role, but it's sort of at the intersection of nanomaterials and catalysis. Um, and well, what's, what's our main objective? Well, typically when we're looking at nanocatalysts or, or heterogeneous catalyst systems, um, we tend to take our active catalyst and we support it on something else. The reason for this is, is many fold. The, the general things are number one, we end up using less of our typically precious metal active catalyst. So by supporting it, we need less of it. So we don't have as much lost or, or, or buried uh, uh, material that basically is not participating in the catalysis. The support is acting uh, basically as a platform. Um, oftentimes the support itself makes the catalyst recyclable or reusable. So it's something that we can easily recover from the system. And of course, that's good also for reusing, but it also removes the potential heavy metal contamination of having that catalyst uh, being tracked along with your product. And this is the conventional approach. So our idea was to develop and really control catalyst systems that have multiple functionality. So we've drawn that here. So we don't want to have the support just be a, an inactive inanimate support. Um, for the catalyst, we want to have supports that also impart their own catalytic activities. That way we sort of build hierarchical systems that all work together to enhance catalysis. Um, so there's two things we can do. We can have uh, a system where the support itself promotes a different chemical reaction. And then we have what's called the cascade. So an A to B to C, or we can have both the support and catalyst um, promote the same type of reaction. And where the idea is that the more active catalyst site actually is in, in very low percentage loading, but has a major increase on the catalyst activity. And that's what we're going to be talking about uh, today when I, when I highlight this example. So here um, I've got a really simple system that um, is, is very similar to a lot of uh, nano catalyst systems in the literature. Uh, it utilizes an iron oxide core, and this is particularly nice because this makes them magnetically separable. So what we were able to do is grow iron oxide um, dotted with very low, almost ultra low loading of palladium acetate in a conventional hydrothermal type fashion. Um, again, fairly controllably without surfactants. So from a sustainability perspective, this is nice. And what we did that's really, really different from what other people do is we then took these particles 
and with collaboration with uh, Parag Banerjee's lab. And we did some zinc oxide atomic layer deposition on them. But unlike the conventional approach where we overcoat the particles, what we did is we just sparsely dosed them. And as you'll see in the next couple of slides, this basically ended up just filling defects um, on the iron oxide core. And because both for the reaction system that we're interested in, both the iron oxide and the palladium are active, we basically managed to selectively shut off one part of the catalyst. And you'll see what, what that entails. So of course, one of the nice things about being able to work with nanomaterials um, is the fact that we can get some uh, you know, really nice images. And some of these images were done in collaboration with actually uh, Xiaofeng's group. So uh, much appreciated from his contribution to this project. And again, you can see spherical iron oxide particles with a few sort of dotted uh, small palladium particles, which are very highly catalytically active. Now, when we treat them with zinc oxide ALD, there's basically nothing um, morphologically different to them. And that's, that's the whole idea. We, we dose them with zinc oxide and we don't fundamentally change anything. We just sort of fill in a few spots. And you can see these examples uh, here where we've got uh, this really beautiful high resolution palladium particle. There's no evidence of anything overcoating it or hindering. It's just the palladium particle. And when we look at the elemental mapping below, you can see in the final one where they aggregate that the zinc is sort of patchy. It's going in different places and it's not really overcoating the palladium. And that's what we wanted. We sort of just dosed and introduced a bit of zinc oxide to the surface. Uh, and so you might be wondering why zinc oxide? Well, the process for growing it is, is really well known. It's well behaved and it's catalytically inert for the system that we're looking at. So it's basically, it's, it's just a complete, it's a filler. And this is sort of the, the general scheme of what we're exploiting is the fact that when we do atomic layer deposition, we're getting preferential growth on these uh, terminal groups, these OH groups on the metal oxide and the residual groups from our molecule that we're dosing, they end up poisoning the surface of the palladium. And so while the rest of the material can grow on the iron oxide, the palladium rests mainly um, an inhibitor, at least in the early few cycles. So we have this specific interpretation down here that's been drawn where basically you have this iron oxide core, these palladium particles, and when we dose the zinc oxide, it becomes patchy all over the surface, but we don't really affect the palladium that much. And so of course we've been talking about catalysis and the idea is, well, what has this done to the catalysis? So what we have here is a large substrate scope of reductions that we typically run. Um, these are conventional uh, reaction systems that people typically use to test nanocatalysts. So these provide a good sort of backdrop in, in comparison to what's in the literature. And I'm not going to go into the specifics, obviously, because of, of the limited time that we have. But I'll point your attention here, where basically the iron oxide itself is catalytically active. Once we add the palladium, in some cases, the activity increases by quite a bit. And then we dose the zinc oxide. And what happens is we have sometimes a change in activity, but sometimes the activity increases, decreases, or stays the same. So when we normalize that here, where we have pre and post zinc oxide deposition, again, you see that example of activity increasing, activity decreasing, activity staying with an error. And so to keep this short, basically, this is what we're postulating that is occurring. So what we have is a iron oxide core that represents most of the surface area of the particle that is catalytically active, but it's slow. So it promotes this reaction, but does it slowly, but there's a lot of it. On the other hand, we have a few of these palladium sites, which also promote this reaction, but they're much faster. There's very, very, very few of them, it's basically below 0.3 weight percent. When we dose with zinc oxide, what happens is we cut off the reactivity at the iron oxide and we leave only the activity at the palladium. So basically, we've shut off the activity of a two-part system. We've shut off the slow activity. And what you're seeing here is some cases where, by shutting off the slow activity, we actually increase the overall rate. That means we're, we're basically stopping the slow reactions and funneling only to fast ones. Uh, in other systems, the counterbalance is more or less the same. And in some, it goes much slower. And that tells us that the iron oxide is surprisingly important and fast in that system. But by shutting it off, the palladium actually just isn't that reactive. So basically what we've developed is a simple way to modify the reactivity of, of the cat, 
catalysts on the surface in, in a very predictable um, and more robust way using zinc oxide ALD. And we've also now, we're able to see what level of synergism between the two particle system we have by shutting one off and seeing the difference that has an impact. So academically, it's giving us this opportunity to study more in depth, what is their interplay together. And so I'm pretty much getting close to my 10 minutes. So I'm briefly just going to acknowledge my, my group members that did this, of course, the really important collaborators that made this happen. Xiao Feng, who's speaking today, Parag Banerjee and Fu Dong Lu. Um, and here I mentioned some of the ongoing collaborations that I've had at UCF. And of course, um, I am always welcome to discuss any possibilities if there's something that we can do in terms of catalysis uh, materials or materials modification. Thank you. Thank you, Tizel. Uh, interesting talk. Um, the questions from the Dean. Um, again, to the audience, uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please uh, type in the chat. Um, you have collaborated with people outside UCF, um, uh, inside UCF. Um, yes, so yes. Uh, can you articulate uh, some of the work uh, uh, that you are doing with them uh, and, it, and its importance? Right. I, th I think... Um... I, I'm working extensively or, or have in the past with Xiaofeng and, and Fudong on solid catalysts and, and their applications and characterizations in the more traditional sense. Uh, the stuff that's completely out of my, my regular realm that I've been involved with quite heavily is with uh, Parag Banerjee and Chris Davis, when you know, we've been using ALD uh, and designing new molecules for ALD to support uh, solar cell, solar energy research which I think is something I would not have been involved with if collaborations like this didn't arise. Um, and of course, ALD is a really powerful tool for uh, making materials in a controllable way with a you know, very small, um, uh, th very, very narrow thicknesses and really high aspect ratios. Um, I also work a lot with uh, Lorraine Tatard uh, for uh, obviously surface characterizations and looking at mechanisms. And I have a shared student with Lei Zai in the nanomaterials nanocatalysis aspect. Um, again, these are all, all fairly broad. And if anyone has anything where they think I could be of use, uh, or if you are doing something that you think is of use to me, please let me know.